Um, so welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this session um, on world water quality overlooked and undervalued. And um, today we're going to be uh, talking about catalyzing action for continued work on water quality monitoring. Um, touching on both surface water and groundwater. So welcome everyone to the session. Um, thank you very much to those who are joining live. Thank you also to those who will be watching at a later date since it is being recorded and you will have access to this even after the World Water Week um, is over. Um, again, this session on water quality is part of our collective efforts um, under the banner of the World Water Quality Alliance to better understand the state of water quality around the world, as well as some of the different approaches available for assessing water quality, um, learning about how data on water quality is used and what are some of the challenges in obtaining it, but also what are some of the emerging solutions and technologies um, to kind of help bridge some of, some of these gaps. Um, because finally, it's imperative that we keep this most vital resource on our planet under review. Um, I hope some of you had the chance to follow our sister session on groundwater that was convened earlier in the day um, by UNESCO, um, which you can of course also see in a recording, uh, which delved into why groundwater is such a vital resource uh, despite its hidden nature and how it can be monitored. Um, so we'll start with a quick introduction um, to the water quality um, monitoring context and also around how we set up the World Water Quality Alliance. Uh, it's convened by UNEP, but it is a multi-stakeholder platform um, to advocate for the, um, the importance of maintaining fresh water quality around the world. We'll then go to a quick poll and then move on to the presentations from our four expert panelists who are here with us today, um, wrapping up with an opportunity to participate in a Q&A session uh, with the expert panel and also some next steps for action leading up to the to the development of a world water quality assessment. Um, again, please refer to some documents that are already in the Pathable platform. Um, and please enter in your questions in the chat on Pathable as we go in this, um, what will be an interactive session. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce you to um, Dr. Hartwig Kramer, uh, the head of global environment monitoring at UNEP's science division um, for an introduction. Over to you, Hartwig. Thanks very much for giving me the floor, Nina, and uh, thanks to our co-conveners for running this session with us. As you quite rightly say, world water quality is an issue and it's an alliance effort, and I'm quite grateful to have the alliance as the hub mechanism behind this session. So let's go right into the into the matter. And, and, and let me tell you that water quality, uh, compared to what was in the past under Millennium Development Goals is something that has been overlooked for decades. It's a wicked problem because it's complex, no clear solutions are seen as unforeseen outcomes and it's really it's, it's really not as popular as water quantity and, and, and I mean if it has been looked into then largely under the broader realm of drinking water not so much as an environmental asset. And if the SDGs are really meant to really bring us into a universal framework of mutually reinforcing frameworks and globally agreed goals, you see in this slide that they are not necessarily all mutually reinforcing because really providing energy to all and, and, and providing food security may result in uses of fertilizers in use of fertilizer for food production or renewable energy resources and crops that on the downside have an effect on water quality. We had a session this morning earlier on groundwater, which is even more complex because you don't see it. And, and that's really a tricky issue. So achieving advancement on one side not necessarily tells us a positive effect on the other. Very typical for a wicked problem. Next slide. Data is the other issue. So it's not the healing of everything. It's an important ingredient because you can't manage what you don't know. Uh, that's a very old statement. But on the other hand, data is not the, f the, the overall solution of everything. But what we have achieved in the global environment monitoring system of the United Nations Environment Program, GEMS Water, was at least by working through the national dedicated focal points to increase the number of available data points up to about 15 million globally from uh, in, in the meantime 37 more countries 
though if you go more deeply into the detail of those data sets you will realize that in terms of time coverage spatial scale as well as parameter coverage they are pretty sketchy and of course as a UN mechanism depending on those data streams that are authorized by member states and shared with us this is the critical bottleneck data information and sharing is yet to be resolved it's all very strategic um, and is is not irrespective of the secretary general's strategy towards data technical collaboration and digital cooperation it's not mainstream to do that automatically um, i'll talk a bit later about the new developments but that is where we currently stand we are making substantial progress but certainly we can't rely on this opportunistic reporting in isolation next slide as a response, and quite logically, at the end of 2017, third session of the United Nations Environment Assembly uh, adopted the Water Quality Resolution, which is really about to address water pollution to protect and restore water-related ecosystems and provide a baseline assessment, go into emerging pollutants and contaminants and address the issue of acting at scale. And certainly acting at scale is an all of society effort. It's an all of UN effort. It's not something UNEP can lift off in isolation without the scientific, technical earth observation and particularly the local communities that engage, which was the emergence of the World Water Quality Alliance. Next slide. And what is this World Water Quality Alliance? It's a voluntary mechanism that raises funds and also sets agendas in a peer discussion mode uh, convened by UNEP but not owned by UNEP. It's a multi-agency and a multi-partner effort combining entities from all of society to first of all deliver the assessment of the freshwater quality and do that in a way that we in future will have more rolled out continued um, appraisals of water quality by combining we we'll learn more about that later in C2 monitoring, the advancement of modeling and remote sensing. Setting agendas means what's at stake? What else is out there respect, uh, besides just looking into the basic parameters of chemical and physical uh, characteristics of water bodies? Find right. funding. Um, about one minute, please. That's, that's all right. Co-design and convening an operational design and, and alliance is the next elements of this alliance. Next slide. It's an all of society. M assessments are in the triangle in the middle that really dig on the three different data sources, but it needs to go into the solution space that is really on partnerships and uh, innovation labs. Next slide. Over time, that is part of the earlier slide on the right side, we would like to get on a lower level the assessment on a more rolling mechanism, but use assessment findings to roll out solutions by developing pilots in an engagement modus with bottom-up processes in the countries with the stakeholders and upscaling with funding, with technology advancement over time. That's where the solution part should take over from the regular monitoring, but the regular monitoring will continue as a rolling mechanism for updating. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Hartwig. Um, for the introduction. So um, we'll move on now to a very quick poll um, that we've set up. Next slide, please. If you could go into the Pathable platform, I think um, probably most of you, if not all, are already familiar with the poll function. It's there on the second tab. So if you could please go into your Pathable platform now, click open the poll and um, answer the first question there, um, which is, um, it's a pretty straightforward one, but it is, um, about um, what do we track with SDG indicator 6.3.2. Um, let me see, it's actually evenly split now, but do we track proportion of population using safely managed drinking water services? Do we track the proportion of bodies of water with good ambient water quality or level of water stress, fresh water withdrawal as a proportion of available fresh water resources? So I'm just expecting after the week to have um, Yes, and I think my assumption was correct in that um, we have 75% of respondents answering that it's the proportion of bodies of water with good ambient water quality that is correct. Um, 
and um, uh, so well done. Um, and again, I, the, what I wanted to highlight here uh, is also to flag that we, we just received the findings from the SDG uh, 6.3.2 report that tracks proportion of um, bodies of water with good ambient water quality. It was released earlier in the week. Um, UNEP is the custodian uh, for this indicator, um, and you can find a comprehensive report um, um, reporting where we're at now. Um, and again, just to flag some of the main findings is that while there was nearly a doubling of countries that contributed to the data, we still have only about just under 90 countries um, who have reported on this indicator. And again, um, this means that there's actually uh, a, a massive lack of water quality data because we have over 3 billion people um, that are at significant risk because of the, the health of their rivers, lakes, and groundwater is unknown. Um, and we can put a link for that report in the chat as well so that you can see the full results. Moving on to the next question, please. Um, this is, again, what do we mean by in situ analysis of water quality? I'm actually very keen to see the results of this. Um, and what do we have? Uh, okay, it's great that we don't see anybody saying that it's jumping into a lake or river and seeing if you develop a rash. Clearly not the way to go, although maybe in some cases the easiest. Um, but um, yes, we have most respondents saying that this is direct measurements in the field. And again, um, uh, I know that we could also refer to in situ being the actual collection of, of results um, that are taken to the lab. But what I wanted to highlight here again is that, uh, you know, while there may be, you know, we could consider even um, both A and B as being the answers here. Um, what we mean by in situ data on water quality means that um, in the strict definition, uh, this requires us to go physically to the water body and use data measuring uh, instruments um, or other measurements in the field um, to record a range of different parameters, whether they're, they're biological oxygen demand, uh, dissolved oxygen, et cetera. Um, and again, uh, or collecting uh, water, quality, water samples that need to be taken to a lab. Again, this requires in-person uh, in -person presence at that water body. So really um, considerable um, measurement um, capacity needed. Um, third question, please. Uh, and this we can leave up. I know that these polls are open for the, for the rest of the, um, the session. So maybe this one we can leave up so that you can keep thinking about it. And this is really just to share two words that describe the main difficulties in obtaining data, good data on water quality. So maybe even if you prefer to answer this at the end, we can try to take a quick look if we have time left um, at this word cloud. Um, so yeah, thanks again to everyone who's, um, who's answered that. Um, hope that was, that was interesting and look forward to seeing what this word cloud is. Um, Okay, moving on to our first expert panelist. Um, I will hand you over to Kenneth Alvarado, who is joining us from Costa Rica, who is from the, um, who's the coordinator for water pollution prevention from the Nicoya Peninsula, and who will tell us a bit about their work and monitoring. Over to you, Kenneth. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you all. Well, the title of my presentation is The Role of the Civil Society in Water Quality Monitoring the case of Nicoya Peninsula Waterkeeper from Costa Rica. Next, please. So some data on why is water quality monitoring very important. So water quality has deteriorated as a result of pollution in nearly all major rivers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Also the number of people with their health in risk because of the contact with these polluted surface waters may range into the tens of millions on these continents. Also, globally, an estimated 80% of all industrial and municipal wastewater is released into the environment without any prior treatment with the detrimental effects on human health and ecosystems. Next, please. So where do we need to monitor? We need to monitor water in surface water and in groundwater because it's especially everything is interconnected. But today I'm gonna speak about a case of surface water monitoring. Next, please. 
So as I mentioned, Nicoya Peninsula Waterkeeper, the organization I represent is a civil society organization that works from Santa Teresa Beach. It's a highly touristic town with a growing development. So we constantly monitor 17 rivers all around the area. As you can see in the map, it is in the south of the peninsula of Nicoya in Costa Rica. Next, please. So why are we monitoring our waters? So mostly we have a critical wastewater pollution problem, as you can see in the river in the image that is in, in the center of our town. So some of the causes of this is that we lack of a communal sanitary sewer system, only also that many individual systems that are, are mostly the septic tanks do not work properly or are directly pouring the wastewater into the rivers. Also, a weak law enforcement capabilities from the authorities and little awareness within the population. Next, please. So what are we monitoring to, to make the point that we have this wastewater uh, issue problem? So we do in situ monitoring using this multi-parameter probe that tests some parameters like pH, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. And also we do take samples to do this ex situ monitoring, taking the samples to a laboratory and doing some critical parameters from wastewater that are biological oxygen demand, ammonial nitrogen, phosphorus, and fecal coliforms. Next, please. So this is the very interesting part. These are some of the results from the most uh, critical polluted rivers in town. So according to the regulation, we have the regulation for the evaluation and classification of the quantity of surface water bodies. As you can see in, in the chart, we use uh, the Dutch system adapted here in Costa Rica. And we take uh, the measurements from three main parameters that are dissolved oxygen saturation, the BOD or the biological oxygen demand, and the total ammoniacal nitrogen. Each of the results of these parameters will give a, a specific point that we all gonna sum of these points. So we have um, one of these five classes. And in the case of these main rivers, we ubicate them in the class number five, as you can see in the chart in the red, in the red area, that are very severe contamination. And also, as you can see in the data, um, we have high levels of biological oxygen demand, for example, that shows the huge amount of uh, organic matter that we have in the rivers, and also alarming numbers of fecal coliforms that shows that directly the wastewater is going to the rivers, as you can see in the image. So next, please. So how we use this data and what challenges do we face? Well, mostly we use this to create awareness in the population, but it is difficult to translate technical data for everybody to understand that we use this on capacity building and on social media, but it's a challenge. And also we share it with the authorities for them to make an informed decision making. But the response even to alarming data is not as fast or effective as we need. Next, please. Some key challenges that we have um, is that they educate the population regarding this existing link between water quality and the human and nature well being. Also, we believe more funding is needed for civil society organizations that run water monitoring from their communities because of the cost of having these instruments and also of doing this ex situ monitoring. Also, we believe the data must be available in useful systems that integrate the different sources of information within a country to improve decision-making. For example, in Costa Rica, the data that the government, uh, be, be, if you are, please, the data that the government uh, generates is not connected to the data that we generate from communities, for example. And here, I think uh, the work from the World Water Quality Alliance may be key 
uh, to help countries with this. Next, please. And finally, some final messages that I want to point is that we need more and better water quality data to identify sources of pollution and stop it. Also, strong advocacy in order to position this issue within the priorities of the countries in a context of climate crisis. And also that the participation of civil society and especially youth people is key. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for your presentation. Um, moving on, we have our second panelist now, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Christian Schmidt uh, from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, you have said, who will be speaking about obtaining data on water quality. Over to you, Christian, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nina, for your introduction. Um, yet a second presentation of the session will be about the availability of global water information as well as its current shortcomings and gaps and yeah, the possibilities how to at least partially close these gaps. And um, I am the coordinator of a project called Globe WQ and it contributes to the World Water Quality Alliance and it's aiming on building better water quality information services. So you've probably all used a weather app at some point and billions of people did so too. So virtually anywhere on earth up-to-date information on temperature, rainfall, and wind speed is available. The chances, the, the chances are also that you've never used the water quality app um, to check the water quality status of your nearest river, lake, or groundwater well, simply because um, such an app is not existing, at least to my knowledge. Um, yeah, beyond a missing app, it is alarming that in the last progress update on SDG 6, um, Nina just referred to it. Uh, it was found that uh, no water quality information is available for over 3 billion people. And this is alarming because on the other hand, in the GEMSTAT water quality database, there are yeah, 15 million data points of 13,000 stations, and which seems to be a lot, but, uh, uh, but we have also learned that spatial distribution and the recency of the data is not consistent. And this, so next slide, please. And this um, patchy data is a problem because to make data useful, it, it must be consistent and it must be recent because the time scales for what a quality that are relevant, uh, they are very different. So on the one hand, there are acute events like algal blooms, like you can see on the left picture, um, and these algal blooms, they occur within hours or days. And so data that is five or 10 years old, uh, there will not be of help here in um, yeah, reacting or constraining um, these algal blooms. On the other hand, it's important uh, to have a long-term time series to identify long-term water quality trends. So on the one hand, um, uh, you, you need those for detecting rising trends but also to track the success, the success of water policies and um, mitigation measures that have been implemented to improve water quality. So the next slide. So yeah, what are the um, steps we can take uh, to improve the water quality information that is available? And um, we can also be inspired here by, by weather services. So because also weather information does not only rely on in situ data, but it also relies on remote sensing data and models. And this is what we are trying to approach in the World Water Quality Alliance as well. It's called the triangular approach. And uh, the idea is to, on the one hand, um, get additional information um, by using satellite remote sensing. Um, so for example, satellite images from the Copernicus Sentinel-2 satellite. It's, they are available free of charge and they can be applied practically everywhere on the globe. Um, because of the resolution, they can be applied to lakes and large rivers. And if data is processed timely, one can get near real-time information on, on optical water quality parameters like uh, turbidity or chlorophyll. But also uh, within C2 data, it is highly likely that so far, we only have access to the tip of an iceberg uh, of data that is compiled into databases. So what needs to be done is like connecting regional databases 
um, so that information is available easily, but also to make data that is stored somewhere on a local hard disk to make those data available. Because in situ data provides ground truthing and the options for calibration for water quality models and ground truthing for satellite data. And it also allows to observe a wide range of parameters. And in situ data is probably the, the information source that has the longest time record. So for some stations, uh, there's data available since the 1950s. And then last but not least, water quality models, they're the integrators of the different data sources and they can be used to generate spatially and temporarily continuous water quality information products. And uh, models are the only tool that can look into the future. So they can be used for predictions or they can be used to develop scenarios for different boundary conditions or for different measures so that you can test what will be the most effective uh, way of improving water quality or prevent its deterioration. Next slide, please. And one way to provide water quality information, not only data, but really information products in a user-friendly form, also for non-experts, are digital platforms. They really have great potential here. And the Globe WQ project is developing one of such platform for hosting, visualizing, and analyzing water quality data, as well as its drivers. But I would like to explicitly mention that there are other platforms out there as well. Like there's the World Environmental Situation Room um, run by UNEP. There are also other platforms like Digital Earth Africa. So some are global, some are regional. So there are many out there. The Globe WQ platform, it specifically aims on integrating in situ data, remote sensing information, and information from water quality models. And they will all be merged in a single application. And the platform will allow you to download data, of course, but maybe um, also important, you can also upload um, data. So it makes or it facilitates data sharing um, with very low entry level. And one of the key ideas of the Globe WQ platform and the project is that on the one hand, global data will be available, but there will be also tailored regional data products um, for so-called use cases, um, which are developed in a co-design process. One of these use cases is Lake Victoria at the moment, and there was a need for better chlorophyll information and its drivers. So we were aiming on combining information uh, on chlorophyll from remote sensing and um, in situ data with modeled nutrient loadings to the lake. Hi, Christian, one, one minute, please. Next slide, yes. Um, yeah, we all know that water quality problems can be regionally different, but also water quality problems change over time. So for example, artificial fertilizers since the 1950s, uh, they have led to increase in nutrient concentrations in groundwater and surface water, mainly in Europe. And for newly emerging contaminants, it's the problem that it always takes some time until harmonized monitoring methods are available, uh, but they are important to make data comparable. And such an emerging contaminant uh, of global concern has been plastics. And um, it has been recognized that the solution to ocean plastics lies on land. So many, many monitoring activities have been uh, implemented, but data is often hardly comparable because of the unharmonized methods. So, and I would like to advertise here a little bit uh, the recently published guidelines for monitoring plastics in rivers and lakes, which should help to harmonize the monitoring methods. And they are somehow in line with the SDG monitoring approach, uh, where we prefer simple methods and simple parameters like counting macroplastics from a bridge so that monitoring programs can be easily implemented basically everywhere without the need for elaborate infrastructure or particle analytics. Um, so let's wrap it up. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, global water quality information uh, is currently based on in situ data only and it's not sufficient. So we need on the one hand build to build monitoring capacity and encourage data sharing. And, um, and that in situ data is too precious to, to just be stored on local hard drives. Remote sensing has great potential to dramatically improve the spatial coverage and recency of water quality data, but cannot replace in situ monitoring. And also the same as with models. Models can be used for predictions, but they cannot, uh, or they are not reliable without sufficient amount of data. And I'm optimistic that in the future, there will be water quality information available at scale and resolution 
uh, that informed decisions can be made. Yeah, thanks for joining and um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for the really fascinating presentation. Um, and you had mentioned our Lake Victoria use case. So I will hand on straight away to Andrew for a presentation on the Alliance um, Africa use cases. Over to you, Andrew, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, I will be presenting work done on behalf of UNEP and the World Water Quality Alliance. Um, this presentation serves to provide an overview of the World Water Quality Alliance Africa use cases with funding provided by the Swiss uh, Federal Office of the Environment. If we could jump to the next slide, please. So the central aim of the Africa use cases was the integration of three types of data to derive the best possible state of water quality. This data being each side of the triangle that Hartwig and Christian detailed uh, just earlier. This was combined with a multi-stakeholder driven process defining the demand for water quality products and services. The use cases were a pilot to demonstrate the value added approach to bridge from data to solutions. This can be summarized by the objective of using experience and global challenges to support local solutions, providing an evidence base that links water quality hotspots to solutions and investment priorities. These selected Africa use cases were the Cape Town aquifer systems in South Africa, the Lake Victoria transboundary basin, focusing on Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, and the transboundary Volta River Basin, focusing on Burkina Faso and Ghana. Next slide, please. So with regards to Lake Victoria, the use case concept was presented to local stakeholders in Kenya and Uganda in 2019, with attendees including academics, NGOs, government representatives, and the Lake Victoria Basin Commission and Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization. Due to COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic, and travel restrictions. Subsequent virtual workshops were organized in 2020 with Lake Victoria Fisheries Institutes in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. The aim of these meetings was to discuss and identify data and information products and services to be co-developed by the riparian fisheries organizations and alliance representatives to target identified water quality hotspots. The water quality products and services agreed upon were the use of available data sources to indicate the potential for coastal eutrophication at the lake. This was a collaboration between the lake fisheries organizations, the earth observation experts ILMAP, and the Royal University of Bochum. The other two products and services were a simulation of lake temperature dynamics to inform the extent of stratification and vertical mixing, as well as a focused study on sediment releases of nutrients to the lake. These studies were a collaboration between the Lake Fisheries Organizations and the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. Next slide, please. So the Lake Victoria use case identified challenges and opportunities that were common at the other study areas. The use case confirmed the general lack of in situ water quality data in Africa. As a result, there is a need to use alternative data sources as per the triangle approach. Further, it was noted that water quality innovations and solutions don't always have the desired impact resulting in engaged or sorry, resulting in reduced engagement and data sharing, highlighting the need for a bottom up approach to engagement. There's a general lack of shared databases to store data, especially in transboundary situations. As a result, there is a need for a common data management system that allows for better collaboration. While databases were developed in the past, these were noted to be project specific with maintenance stopping after the project end. Hence, there is a need for databases to be owned and run by the data providers. There is a need for regional policy for data and information sharing to ensure a standard procedure and to ensure data and information providers retain ownership and recognition for the data. There's also a need for the promotion of the trust in sharing data to existing platforms. There was a call for in country capacity building and the collection, assessment, and management of various data types used in the triangle approach. There was also a north south divide noted where data is provided to foreign collaborators with limited benefit to in country data providers. Thus, there is a need for data sharing procedures and ongoing development of partnerships and trusted collaboration. There was also a need to improve the impact of research through more effective science policy interface and to better communicate the science to policymakers via impact stories. In-country funding by government was also noted to be a challenge, 
with a need for additional contributions via long-term investment, including international funding. Next slide, please. A similar stakeholder engagement process as Lake Victoria was followed at the Volta use case. There was in-country attendance at key conferences. If we can go to the next slide, please. There seems to be a slight delay. Um, I'll continue. So um, there was attendance at in-country uh, conferences in Accra in 2019. In addition, there was a stakeholder engagement workshop in Accra in 2020 with representatives from government, academia, the private sector, and non- and intergovernmental organizations attending. I'll stop here while we get to the slides so that you've got uh, visuals in front of you. Um, so just as a quick recap, um, we uh, attended um, a conferences in Accra in 2019. There was a stakeholder engagement workshop in Accra in 2020 with representatives from government, academia, the private sector, non intergovernmental organizations. However, unlike Lake Victoria, the Volta Basin use case did not fully succeed in the stated aims. This was due to various factors, including a fragmented institutional landscape in Ghana with no single consolidated government department mandated to water quality monitoring, and, a, and different institutional landscape and government structures in neighboring countries, despite there being a single Volta Basin authority. As a result, additional efforts are needed to adopt a different approach to social engagement and co-design for the Volta use case in future, such as engaging local influential role players that are active in the sphere of environmental support or education. Next slide, please. Lastly, the Cape Town use case focused on urban groundwater that differed from the other two surface water use cases in that there was extensive in-situ data available. Groundwater does not allow the use of remote sensing and satellite techniques for direct measurements of water quality. However, these techniques do provide useful proxies. Further, the modeling comprised not only numerical models, but also GIS-based modeling of aquifer vulnerability and risk to pollution. These differences allowed for the Cape Town use case to have a more seamless integration of the triangle data types due to a single integration team. The success of the Cape Town use case was also driven by a robust stakeholder engagement process that developed trust and collaboration over many years. Next slide, please. Andrew, if... oh, thank you. <laughs> one minute, <laughs> I won't take any more. So thank you. And I look forward to uh, questions and uh, discussion as part of this panel. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're moving on to Viviana. Viviana, over to you, please. Um, who's the assistant professor from the University of Pisa linking into the groundwater. Over to you, thank you. Thank you, Nina, and greetings, everyone. So next slide, please. So in this presentation, I tried to kind of wrap up and bring us bring up some insights and thoughts for reflection. For example, I will start saying that when I think of the topic of today's session, I always question myself and ask uh, why there is a, such a discrepancy between the amount of information we have available and the number of water quality issues that we experience worldwide. For example, if we type on Science Direct and we search for water quality, we can see that we have more than 160,000 uh, papers on uh, water quality, so dealing with these issues. So it can be can seem a paradox to to consider if this corresponds to the amount of information available. How can we have so many persisting issues worldwide? So uh, next slide, please. We can clearly try to find the causes in the identification of the challenges related to the actually source apportionment and try to uh, assess how many and multiple and emerging sources of contamination emerges and also Clearly, this has to deal with the uh, complexity of the interactions within the water cycle, in particular when groundwater is at stake, uh, it's even more difficult to monitor, measure, assess, and even perceive the existence of, existence of groundwater given to its invisibility. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, we can see that all this complexity makes up the, the challenges that we have to face in terms of water and groundwater quality. It has been discussed already this morning that even in the case of wild, widely understood issues, such as the case of nitrate and groundwater, we still have a persistence of uh, issues worldwide. So this is a kind of uh, well 
or better known problem compared, for example, to microplastic, antibiotics in groundwater, and so on and so forth. But still, as we can see in this map, we have so many aquifers worldwide, in this case in Africa, that are affected by nitrate contamination. And from this map, I think it's very powerful to see that there is a strong connection between the most densely populated areas and the amount, in this case of nitrate contamination, but also in general pollution. So uh, I think there is a third component that has already mentioned in some of the previous talk that we have to take into account, and this is people. So in the next slide, we will see a scene that happened in, uh, to me a while ago when I was doing my master project field work in, in, in Senegal, and we were trying to understand and assess the causes of nitrate contamination in groundwater. And at the same time, we were chatting with the owner of the well, telling him or telling the community probably to be careful into um, assessing and or let's say drinking the water that could be, have been possibly polluted so um the answer that they gave us is what you see in the in the slides so we have to bear in mind that in many cases for people the issue is actually to drink or not to drink the water knowing that eventually they will be armed in any case so um this this is why i think it's really important to uh take into account when talking about groundwater quality, also to look more closely to the reciprocity between people and groundwater, and thus to see people not only as a source of the problem, but also part of the solution. Uh, next slide, please. So here we see another example that I'm sure that happened is something that happened to all working in the field and taking measurements. So when we do our in situ measurement, as it was mentioned before in the pool, afterwards, if people are around, what they want to know if they can drink the water. But this, to answer this question, we will see in the next slide that there are so many other questions that we have to address and to tackle. Some are really specifically pertaining the scientific domain, let's say, and other are more uh, complex related to governance and management in, in, in general. So, uh, but next slide and going back to the previous question, um, I think the, the key thing is to, to understand that we are actually working on different scales and this can be the, the cause of the paradox that I was mentioning in the beginning. So people need to have access to safe drinking water right now because this is a very urgent need. But science or like measurement, getting data, understanding data, translating them into uh, management practices and solution take time. And this time is not matching with the urgency, urgency of the need. So this is why I think it's uh, uh, clear that the effort and the solution sometimes are not going hand in hand, at least in the, in the short run. So in the next slide, please. Um, the question is, what can we do? So now we, 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 we know that we have a problem, so what can we do? Uh, this is something that has been discussed during the whole World Water Week in, in many sessions. And actually, I want to stress it here because I think it's really important. We have to find new narratives and try to uh, move it has been said many times to break the silos and go beyond classical and sectorial approaches and try to build together across discipline, across field and breaking boundaries. And from the scientific point of view as um, scientists, we have to become a sort of lighthouses where um, that can share knowledge, that can engage firsthand in uh, making more accessible the data and the information that we have to become driver for a change. So next, please. This is the idea behind the concept of socio-hydrogeology that somehow integrates what has been discussed also in the previous um, presentation and one of the key challenges of the World Water Quality Alliance. This approach focuses on the reciprocity between people and groundwater and thus proposes a structured approach to identify the cause and effect relationship between people and groundwater. Water. Does meaning that we can assess how people uh, affect water quality, let's say, but also we have to take into account and understand how a polluted groundwater can affect human well being. And this can be done by systematically including the social component into hydrogeological and hydrogeochemical assessment. So, trying to combine transdisciplinary approaches into hydrogeological assessment. So, next slide, please. Um, and then 
this is the idea that the process is not a straight linear process and means that while we understand the complexity of water quality issue, we have to bear in mind that this cannot be addressed with a pure reductionist approach. And when while we address the paucity of, of data, we can also try to perform capacity building work and contribute to behavioral changes, learning from local know-hows and propose solutions that are really shared and based on real needs of the of the local population. So this will help to make visible not only groundwater, but the real needs and the solution that maybe are present in the local background. And uh, in the next slide, I conclude just stressing that uh, during the next year, we're going to talk a lot about the invisibility and also this afternoon, there's going to be a session um, explaining the topic of next year, World Water Day. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana. Thank you very much. So now we move on um, and really thank you to all the panelists for these fascinating presentations, um, shedding light on um, water quality and how we get information on it. And I thought this one was a very nice one to wrap up with, kind of breaking down some of the silos um, and how to access water quality. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Thank you again, um, everyone who's been attending and, um, and sharing your questions. Uh, we'll start off with a question on citizen science, which indeed has been, a, I've seen there's been quite a few sessions on this um, in the Stockholm World Water Week overall, and it's it's something that we, that is one of our work streams in the Alliance as well. So if I could hand over to Viviana first, and then to Kenneth um, for just a very quick answer um, about citizen science and how this can contribute to water quality monitoring. Well, thank you, thank you, Nina. I think it's, as I said in the presentation uh, very quickly, but I really believe that citizen science can be uh, very, very powerful to promote the um, access to the, the information and get new data on water quality. This is a challenging thing that has to be carefully done and really uh, be, be, be done with the support of the, of the local community and try the key challenges not only to engage people, but also to make sure that afterwards people are willing to understand uh, and put in to practice the, the outcomes of this investigation. And if I can just briefly mention that there is a great paper that recently came out from David Walker that he analyzes actually the um, importance of citizen sciences and how those approaches are actually have to be done and tackled in different ways in the different part of the world, taking into account the cultural norms, cultural values and the motivation that people may have in different parts of the world in uh, engaging in citizen science. Thank you. Kenneth, over to you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Viviana too. And also, yeah, I believe it's key to, to do the citizen science projects because it allows people to be like in the front line uh, from the pollution problems, for example. And, it is common that people even passing by a river every day don't even notice what may be happening there until they are in the river doing the monitoring, having the, having the, the data and trying to understand what's happening. And also it's very useful to involve people in creating solutions. So I think it's very important. And also, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, that funding is needed to support those projects. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And I think uh, maybe Viviana, um, there's a question on the pathable. Maybe you can answer directly about the, the research um, on civil society data. So I'm trying to, to use um, the pathable platform also to answer some of these. We had a question also on from Jennifer on the overview of suggested threshold levels for various pollution parameters. I just flag this um, because Christian, you had answered this in, in Pathable. Anything you want to mention here? Or can we move on? You can move on, I, I typed into the chat. Okay, okay, great. Um, then we had actually a very um, important question um, from Lesha um, about water quality and these databases, which is interesting, but are people with no access to internet going to participate? And so I would maybe um, direct this to, um, it's directed to Christian, but I open it up also to 
um, to the panel. And I know again from the World Water Quality Alliance, we have a social engagement platform which is setting up local water forums as one of its activities. So to kind of aim to connect um, uh, connect local communities, uh, which we recognize that many of them don't have access to internet, don't have access to the to kind of these um, computer systems or even apps that we have um, that we're used to using um, to. Uh, obtain access to water quality. So maybe the question is also how we can how we can help um, provide uh, or, or help raise raise their, raise their awareness and and provide um, information on water quality and engage them in this in collecting information and also using this information. Um, maybe can I ask Christian or even um, Andrew? Maybe I know you had worked with the local community, so maybe you have some perspectives on this. Um, Christian, over to you, and and then maybe Andrew. Okay, I I just also replied in a chat that I think that um, um, that probably more people have access to internet than access to clean water. Uh, but of course, um, I clearly see that at having a internet-based information solution, um, yeah, it, it's not the ultimate. It's not the ultimate way of doing it, and um, and there must be other ways um, how to engage local communities and how to inform people that do not have access to these information sources. Um, yeah, um, to basically yeah how to say to spread the word. But um, honestly, that's that's difficult, and probably Andrew can answer with a more local perspective than than I have. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, I guess from, from my side with the work in the um, African use cases, um, as well as being a uh, South African with, with some experience in very uh, rural um, areas, uh, the use of smartphones is, is increasing. Um, you know, almost everybody has access to a smartphone. Um, the, the biggest limitations are access um, to, to data, which comes at a great cost um, in Africa. So almost the um, best options to increasing access to, to databases are simplified apps with low data needs to allow a simplified um, interface to see uh, the linkage between um, water quality and potential health impacts. Um, uh, and so that might be the best option for actual databases, um, but there might also just be a need for better communication of such um, impacts around water quality through um, platforms such as WhatsApp, where um, there has been some evidence of um, initiatives where um, these key outcomes are, are, are shared via uh, apps like WhatsApp um, and the likes, which allow for better access to such outcomes. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm handing on now to Hartwig. Hartwig. Um, Over to you. Uh, let me just switch on my camera again. I hope you can see me. Um, yeah, two things. One is a, a question that came in on the on the chat and pathable from Jennifer on the standards for certain parameters at thresholds. And I guess the answer to you, Jennifer, is no, because if you if you think about the SDG six, one of the major bottlenecks in the two data drives we've been through is for countries to set national targets. There is a lot out there around drinking water, but basically very little comparably when it comes to environmental parameters and environmental water quality. So that's one point I wanted to refer to. The other thing on the discussion on the engagement and the access to data, if there is no internet connection, I guess what we heard in earlier sessions during Water Week, particularly the, ba the example from Bangalore, I guess key is to establish a social engagement process in, in, in which civil society organizations can take a certain lead and connect to their local people even if they don't have access to, to the latest state of internet facilities. But that the civil society is engaging, like in the burning lakes of Bangalore for instance, is an important thing and it's not just about citizen science as such it's about enabling and empowering citizens 
to test their own hypothesis, to really own subject and parts of the narrative that needs to be tackled around the broader notion of water quality implications. And I guess that is what, what, what we learned from the earlier sessions, and I think that can overcome certain aspects of the problem. It's a, it, it requires a strong network engagement of civil society at scale. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you, Hartwig. Um, and I will add on a little bit to that in my closing messages. But before that, um, um, I'll just flag a, a comment that came in which is from Stuart Warner, given the limited capacity of many government organizations to monitor water quality going forward, a blended centralized decentralized approach that uses regulatory and citizen derived water quality data is a good option. The different methods for integrating these data sources need testing. Um, and again, GEMS Water, uh, which we had flagged earlier has started down this route but more examples are needed and key is getting relevant government organizations on board. Um, so we've seen that there's, um, maybe this is a good segue into wrapping up the session because we have to do that in about um, four minutes, I think, three, four minutes. So I'll start with wrapping it up. Um, and again, just to highlight some of the main, the main, um, issues that have come up from this session. And I see that there's, there were several kind of red threads coming through. Um, and the first one being that, again, we recognize that there are these substantial gaps in data um, for which water quality monitoring efforts need to be improved. Um, and again, whether these are based on, on different types of cha challenges, either technical capacity. Um, again, these are, these are evidenced by what we see on the, the GEMSTAT database and also reflected in the latest SDG indicator report, 6.3.2 indicator report. Um, and again, I think, I think both of these processes are, you can, you can also access country level or regional level information, I believe. So again, helping to get an even clearer view of what the situation is like. Um, and again, to flag that groundwater is often one resource which is less reported just because of its hidden nature. Um, and secondly, um, just to flag that the lack of data on water quality hits the low GDP countries the hardest. And again, uh, in the SDG indicator report to reference that the poorest 20 countries reported on, on just over 1000 water bodies, whereas the richest 24 countries, the ones with the highest GDP reported on 60 times this, on six, almost 60,000 water bodies. So again, if there's no information on this, it means again that uh, we don't, uh, people are, don't know uh, what they're drinking, which then has impacts on health, sanitation, and other, of course, SDGs and development indicators. Um, triangulation approach is promising, um, but it needs more work. And again, to underline what Christian had already said, is that there is really no substitute for in-situ water quality data, which needs to feed into the modeling, uh, validate remote sensing data, and also um, calibrate um, yeah, calibrate the models and be input into the models. So again, there's, there's even though we have these very promising technologies, we dis discussed a bit about citizen science, remote sensing, bringing them together. But again, you do need in situ water quality data at the core. And here, I just wanted to connect also to the to the discussion on the social engagement side, and the internet access to internet. Um, civil society that there are data sharing limitations. We saw this in several of the presentations. Um, they can be at national level, at, at basin level, etc. But again, we need to think outside the box. And this is something that the Alliance is trying to do is to connect again this scientific, the scientific technical community to community engagement. We have a social engagement platform work stream. We have a youth work stream that are really aiming to operate at the local level and also connect to some of the models coming out and, and um, and, and bringing them to communities that maybe wouldn't access this data before. And, um, and of course, we also heard some of the, um, the community level efforts uh, being taken in the in the use cases. Um, I know in the groundwater, we had a bit of, in the earlier groundwater session, we focused in a, um, a bit more for those who are interested on the Cape Town aquifer use case. Um, and there, and that had a very clear community engagement side 
to bridge the technical side. Moving on to the next slide, I'll just try to be very brief because we're coming to the end of our session. Um, as some of the next steps, um, please advocate for increased attention to water quality, whether you're a researcher, practitioner, youth group, local forum, NGO, or civil society. Please get involved with us, the World Water Quality Alliance, um, and follow us in the lead up to the World Water Quality Assessment, which will be released in early 2023. You can join us as a member. Uh, we have seed funding, so you can um, coming up. Uh, um, so this will be available um, through a kind of proposal process. You can also um, become a use case if you're interested in having this approach applied. And please find out more about our work streams. And next slide, please, so that you can see the email address on which you can contact us at. Um, and with very much thank you also to the Swiss Confederation that supports the, the Alliance. Um, please reach out to us through the email you see here. We'll try to put it on the pathable chat. Um, please, you can see also the unep.org slash WWQA. Um, again, please connect to us. This is a big community of practice, again, with um, 14 work streams at the moment, again, connecting uh, researchers, uh, community, uh, youth groups, um, research on, on plastics monitoring in freshwater, on ecosystems, um, and we would love to hear from you. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to our panelists for joining. Thank you to those of you who've joined uh, from around the world and for your questions. And they've, in fact, also been very informative to us. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and wishing you a good day.